because, you know, we heard the phrase, um, they rose to the occasion. But that's not the, that's not the rule, right? That's the exception. And I have this little quote here. It says, um, and it's from a Navy SEAL. It's a Navy SEAL quote. I'm, I don't know if this is really a Navy SEAL, but it was on their webpage anyway. It says, under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. You sink to the level of your training. And um, for those of us that know, like, I mean, even law enforcement, I know my brother in law enforcement, they always have to do this training. They always got to get recertified. Maybe for you too, I know that you need to get recertified in things, right? We need to always be up and get, get our training and, and prove that we are capable and able. Um, so that's why there's so many training facilities, right, around. There's so many practice fields because even in sports, right, Madden, like if you was like, ah, oh, I was good last year, so I'm good this year. No, that's doesn't how it's, it's, not, it's not how it works, right? You need to always be on the cutting edge. You need to always be doing your reps, putting in your reps, getting stronger, getting faster, right? Doing all those things that we know that would keep us sharp. Um, you know, re repetition reinforces our reaction, the reaction times, the reaction movements, right? Repetition, and this is a two-way street, right? Because repetition can also enforce, can reinforce negative um, reactions as well. So we need to do right repetitions. Right, right, right repetitions. Um, something like today, worship service. We come, and this is like a rep, right? We come and we get fellowship. We worship. Um, we do devils, right? We do Bible studies. Uh, we come and reinforce our faith. This is something that we do. We re reinforce, right? It's, it's a repetition that we do to reinforce our faith, right? Having fellowship with one another. Um, today's message is called, as you can see, let hope arise. Let hope arise. Because hope is a choice, and we need to allow it to rise. Amen. Why don't we pray? Father, we come to you. I pray that your word would go forth with power. I pray that we'd be encouraged, we'd be challenged. God, that we would, um, that our hope, if anybody here and their hope is not, not to, is, is at a low level, I pray that you'd raise their hope. God, I pray that if people's hope is at a high level, that you'd even raise it higher, God. But that hope would arise in our hearts, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So anybody, when you guys were younger, I mean, some of you are young still. God bless you guys. But when you're younger, think back. Did you guys take swimming lessons? Anybody take swimming lessons when they were younger? I remember taking, oh, okay, a bunch of us, right? I remember, I don't know if you guys know this, but I took, and I remember at the pool, it was like motorboat. That was the thing. Motorboat, motorboat, go so fast. And I had to kick, right? Motorboat, motorboat, go so slow. And I slowed down on my kicking. But I just remember, for some reason, motorboat, you know? <laughs> I don't know, like, hey. We have, we have to start somewhere, right? Anyone don't know how to swim? I mean, we live on an island surrounded by water. You don't want to raise your hand. That's okay. But anyway, swimming lessons. If you know, if you took swimming lessons or maybe you're a parent or whatever, okay, boy, you're going to learn how to swim. They throw you in the water, right? And it's like you swim or drown, like you survive or, <laughs> or not. Right? And of course, you know, dad or oh, some pointing. Is that how you learn how to swim? <laughs> That's the trauma swimming technique. But... um. Anyway, swimming in, less, uh, swimming in pools is different from swimming in the ocean, right? Like if you ever swam in the, the pool, like you have the lines and you know, like you're swimming straight and there's no current, there's probably no wind. So swimming in the pool is different from swimming in the ocean. Swimming in the ocean is swimming di is different from swimming in rough water where there's currents, there's big waves, right? Um, it's, it's just different. The level of training for, I was a lifeguard before, level of training in being a pool, a pool lifeguard is different from being a, ocean lifeguard i'm sure it's like the lifeguards here are probably different on the north shore where they gotta go out in 50 foot waves and like rescue people with super strong currents right it's, it's just different but they didn't get there overnight right it's repetition so i was when i was praying about this i, was, I felt like the lord said we're going to go through some tough times we're, we're headed through some times that i'm not to be afraid not to cause fear but just to be aware and I was, I was like, Lord, you know, like, I'm just, I'm just, just something in my spirit that I just cannot shake. So I'm like, what can I do to have our church get ready for this? What can I do personally? And this is a personal message, and it, it, it's a personal message every single week. But what can I do to be ready, to ready our people, the people who the Lord put me in, you know, as, as, as responsible for? Right, so I was thinking like, Again, not to cause fear, but wading in four feet of water on the shallow end is different from swimming in the deep end. Um, you know, when you swim, I don't know if you guys swim, but I, we used to, I used to, um, we used to have a pool at our church and I used to oversee the, the pool. Like, so it was just an Olympic sized pool. And 
you know, people used to swim laps on the forefoot side, right? And if they're tired or they cramp, they just pop up, they stand and they walk to the edge, right? They get out, they climb out. It's different when you're swimming and you're in the 12 foot end, right? And you get them cramped. It's super different, right? It's, it's just, it's different. So you, under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion. You sink to your level of training. And then everything we know supports this. Even in, um, well, Hollywood, right? Maybe Hollywood is exception where you see this normal person, right? And that's what we like. We like those stories that this normal person goes and, it's a pet peeve of mine. Can I just say, right? You get this normal person that is not really trained, specially trained. And then they're beating all the special trained guys, all the, you know, like the bad guys that, well, good thing they're not shoot. They're like missing the guys, like an automatic weapon. And he can't even shoot that one guy who's on civilian. I mean, you know, it's a little pet peeve of mine. Anyway, back to the message. Right, because I'm sure the bad guys are training, but that's just I just ruined movies for a lot of you. But uh, that's okay. You guys can watch it in misery with me. But um, but don't get me wrong. You know, I love the underdog story, and that's basically what Hollywood is trying to communicate, right? The underdog story, and we love underdog stories. We all love the story of David and Goliath, right? The little this this guy that that slayed the giant Goliath that was. Um, mocking God and mocking the people of God. It's basically a good versus evil, right? And you can read about it in 1 Samuel 16 and 17. But also David, um, although David was an underdog, you know, in the world standards, he was anointed. Sometimes we forget he was an underdog. He was anointed. He was practiced. And he was promised. He was a son or he was... He was anointed and he was promised to be the king. God had his call on, on David's life. He was anointed, but he still continued to work at his craft. You know, in, um, in Samuel 17, he talks about like how when he was watching over his father's sheep, like the bear or the lion. So we see that he was putting in his reps. He wasn't just, you know, not doing anything. And all of a sudden he goes up and he just slings the stone. He defeats Goliath and, and that's how it happened. That's not how it happened. He was in the fields and he was practicing his craft, right? He was watching his father's sheep he was probably practicing the sling in those days like it's different from you know now how we how we think of the slingshot so even though he was overlooked by man god knew where he was and god knew how to get a hold of him if you feel overlooked if you feel like you know you, you're doing these reps and you know what are you doing these reps why are you being faithful god sees god sees us right and we got we need to start somewhere god sees you where you're at amen god sees you and he knows his faithful. He knows who he can call on. And he calls us. You know, it's like studying for a test, right? If you're in school or if you're, you're still in school, studying for a test, it's not like you're just going to, well, you know, you don't look at your notes or anything. Of course you're going to study. I mean, unless you're super smart and you have like, um, what's that, photo, photo jet, photographic memory or whatever. Um, but you probably have to study. Even those guys, I don't know, do this really smart people, do they have to study? I don't know, because I'm not in that category. Very little. Oh, you speaking from experience. <laughs> Thanks for confirming, Ryan. <laughs> I don't know if you're like me, but when I was younger, I used to get like C's, right? And I'm studying hard. I cannot go out and play. And there's my brother. He's riding bicycle down the street. Like he's 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 at private school, he's at HBA, and he's like riding bike. And I'm like, Right, studying hard and they're getting C's, you know, like if I get them B, it's like, yes. <laughs> but he's like playing and I'm like studying. I'm like, what's, what's up with that? And I talked to him about it and he, he didn't even know. I was like, man, I was jealous of you, bro. And he's like, I didn't know. I was like, yeah, what's up, God? You know? <laughs> but anyway, every challenge in our life is an opportunity to, ha to help us to be more like Jesus. And this is where I'm, except, you know, every challenge except geometry. <laughs> I don't know what geometry was there for, but anyway, when I think back in school, right, what is that geometry? We don't use, I don't use it. Anyway, every, every challenge, but I'm getting into my text here is Romans. I'm going to be in Romans chapter five. So if you have your Bibles, um, you can, you can highlight, you can take it out, mark it up, um, what the Holy Spirit speaks to you. But I'm going to be in Romans chapter five. And I'm going to read today from the, um, ESV, which is the English standard version. And you guys know last week when I spoke, I was just joking, right, about the fantasy, the new fantasy version. There's no such thing, the NFV. Because I was talking to someone and they're like, oh, yeah, you know what? Uh, my friends use that version. I was like, no, bro, that's not one real version. 
So I just want to make sure, okay, that you're not using the NFV, which is the new fantasy version. But anyway, we're going to be in the ESV. And it says this. This is Paul's letter to the Romans. And he says, and I'm just going to pick it up in verse 1, but he's talking about being justified. He's talking about Abraham being justified. And we kind of went over this um, last year, but Romans 5.1, it says this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, or we've been made righteous by faith, we have peace with God. Okay, I want you to mark that. Peace with God to our Lord Jesus Christ, to him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace which we stand, and we rejoice in hope for the glory of God. Right, so because of faith, we have peace with God. So I want to put, I hope that we can put that in memory banks. Because we have, and we're singing about it, right, we have peace with God. Because of faith, we have hope and expectation of a future glory. So we already, we already win. I want to say that. That we already win because of our faith. We already have peace with God. And we have a promise of future glory. Turn to, turn to somebody and say, we already won. We already have the victory. We're already victorious in the Lord, right? If you have faith in God, you already are a winner. You have peace with God. And you have hope and the expectation of glorious future. Right? So let's continue because it's going to go, it's going to go a little dark for a little while. But verse 3, it says this. Romans 5, 3, it says, um, so you know, Paul says, because of faith, you have peace with God. You have a hope and expectation of glorious future. And he says this in verse 3. Not only that, that's great. I have peace with God. I have hope. Awesome. And Paul says, not only that, guys, but rejoice in our sufferings. <laughs> wait, 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 Paul. I like the peace with God part. I like the hope part. But what are you talking about? Rejoice in sufferings. So as you see in, in there, I put in like what the word could mean as well. In other versions, it says, um, we rejoice in sufferings. Sufferings is trouble, distress, affliction. How many of you are like, oh, no, no. I, if you're in a buffet line and there's distress, affliction, and trouble, I probably pass over that, like passing over the salad. You know what I mean? It's like, I get the rice, pass over the salad, maybe some mac salad, right? Some squid luau, choke on the rice with the shoyu chicken, gravy all over. Right, anyway, um, is that what we have today, Doc Rouse? Squid luau? No. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but mark that now. I'm not really joking now. <laughs> no, no, I just play. I just play. We're grateful for, you know, the ministry of Doc Rob and Henry and um, the hospitality crew, right? Amen. I'm super grateful for that. And um, so anyway, back to the message, all distracted. So not only that, we're, um, we rejoice in our sufferings. And I want to point out that we, Paul is saying rejoice in. Sometimes you can be like, oh, I can rejoice when I'm suffering. And you think like you have to rejoice for. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says rejoice in. So when you're going through the suffering, that we rejoice in the oppression. I know some for some people it's harder than others. And some of us, we go through suffering that is more, it's just of more intensity than others. Some of us, um, trouble is, you know, maybe a coworker looking at us bad or not telling us good morning. That's our trouble. Whereas other people are dealing with life threatening issues. That's their trouble, right? There's a spectrum of trouble that we can, that Paul is saying to rejoice in our suffering. Why, Paul? Why am I going to rejoice in my sufferings? Because he says this, knowing that, well, we, we can rejoice in our sufferings because we have peace with God and we have hope, right, of a glorious future. That's why we can rejoice in. But he goes on, he says, not only that, but he says rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance or patience. Ever pray for patience? Careful, guys. <laughs> I need patience, Pastor. I'm going to pray for hey, You go ahead and pray for patience. You know, because suffering, it says, produces endurance or patience. Verse 4. And endurance produces character. So you, you're going to get patience. It's going to give you character. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to discourage you from praying for patience. Just be aware when you pray for patience that it might include something else. <laughs> right it's like you want to get stronger i want to get faster well you got to go through the training bro and you got to pump those muscles you got to use those muscles it's like i guarantee you the band up here didn't just show up and rise to the occasion right jerry you guys didn't just you guys didn't just show up 
I mean, I was watching, I was having fun watching Eric play the bass. And he didn't just show up and rise to the occasion, right? He had to play that. And I'm sure when you started, it was like, oh man, you get frustrated because like, you're trying to do that run. And if you, if you do anything like that, you understand that it's a repetition, right? Because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. And this word character is proof. Battle tested. You guys, I don't know if, how many of you guys like to buy like equipment and it's like army stuff. Like, I don't know, like, you know, army stuff or tactical stuff. It just seems to last longer, right? Because it's built, it's made to be battle tested. It doesn't shred as much. If you get, you know, stuff like that, it's like, it just seems to handle more abuse, right? Because it's battle tested. This is what Paul is talking about. He's saying that when we can rejoice in our sufferings, that we know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, or we're battle-tested. And character, this is what I want to get to, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, um, who has been given to us. I debated, and you can tell me later if this was a good story or not, but I debated of telling the story. So this, this study by this guy, Dr. Um, Kurt Richard, Richard, done at Harv Harvard in the 1950s. And it was a study with domesticated rats and um, wild rats. And wild rats, you think like, oh, they're tougher, right? They're going to like, you know, they're going to power through. But the study was to see how long these rats would live. I mean, they'll swim. And maybe you've, you've heard of the study. So he would put, um, Dr. Richard put the rats, the domesticated rats, put one rat in this, um, in this um, bucket and saw how long the rat would last. The first rat only lasted two minutes and they drowned. The second one went a little bit longer, and then he swam down, I think, trying to find a you know, way out, and then he drowned. Right? Then he thought, oh, for sure, the wild rats, these rats are known that they can swim, their swimming abilities. These guys are going to last long. No, the wild rats lasted probably about 15 minutes. But it's interesting, that I thought that was interesting, is that um, he did another, the, another part of the test is, just when the rat, the domesticated rat was going was gonna to give up, when it was just about to drown, he would pull the rat out dry them off, let them kind of recover, and put them back in. And you know what is interesting? The study, this, this is the part I'm not talking about, and you know, don't call PETA or anything like that. Uh, but this is the part of the story that I thought was interesting, though, the study, is that those rats that were rescued just at the brink of, of um, drowning, those rats lived like three days. They had swam. After they put them back in, the rats just kept on swimming around for like two to three days until they, until they gave out. Well, what is the difference? The difference was they had this hope, right? And you might think, oh, it's so cruel. Don't get stuck on that part, okay? I know. I was stuck on that for a little while, but I was like, you know, we, the thing is, without hope, without hope, they lasted two minutes, 15 minutes at the most, without hope. But with hope, they lasted days. And that's the thing, right? When Paul is saying that we have peace with God, and we're not, I'm not comparing us to rats, kids. Okay? So don't walk out and like, well, oh, what is the one thing you got from message today? Pastor Dave said it was like rats. No, that's not what I'm saying, okay? I just want to make sure, and don't feel bad if you catch a rat. Like I was talking to somebody who felt bad, and they're like, oh, I'm going to let them go. And they're going, where are you going to let them go, bro? You're going to let them go by the neighbor's halls. They come back, right? So anyway, may the Lord give you wisdom. I'm not going to tell you how. We all have our methods. Right, but you ask the Lord. Okay, anyway, I don't want to get in trouble. I just want to be politically correct on the rat um, issue. Uh, but anyway, for whatever that's worth, I don't know. I don't care. Anyway, so the rats, okay, back to the, back to the Bible, is because of our faith, we have peace with God. We have this hope and this expectation of, glorious, of a glorious future. The end result of suffering, trials, affliction in God's economy, the end of that, the, the sum total of the suffering in God's economy, in giving, in rejoicing in the suffering, the result is hope. That's what we just talked about, right, with this experimentation. The result is hope. And it's not something that we can order online and we're going to get next day delivered. Like, I'll have five servings or five, um, five quantity of hope. No, it's not something that we can go to the store and get. It's something that we need to build, right? It's a process that we need, to, we need to build in ourselves. I mean, think of your affliction story. I know that we all have affliction stories. Like some of us, you know, 
sometimes we forget that we all have a story. Think of a story and how you maybe might have encouraged someone because of them, wa them watching you walk through your affliction, your testimony. Maybe today you're stronger. Well, you probably are stronger. You're wiser, right? You have an increase of faith. Or you think of someone else's, excuse me, someone else's affliction story, right? We hear people of, that give testimony of their affliction story. Like, wow, you walk through that. That's impossible. Man, you're going to die. You, maybe you even died for a little while. And like, I've heard stories like that. Like, wow, God has his hand on you, right? We're encouraged when they come to the Lord and they say, yeah, you know what? But God did this in my life, right? That's because they had to go through that story. They had to go through the affliction. They had to go through the problems, the troubles, right? And they came out the other side stronger. Affliction creates opportunity for character growth. Testimony, right? It's a testimony that we have for, for God's glory. You know, I think of the Bible like where God used weak. He used the weak. He's, I mean, if you read your Bible, just look who he uses. Really, like make a note of who God uses. He uses the weak. He uses the marginalized. He uses the remnant. Why does he do that? So he can get the glory. I mean, you read the, when you read the Bible, or think of the stories, who he's using. He's not using like the super strong. I mean, maybe Samson, but we see Samson's story, right? If you know the Bible, we see Samson's story. But he uses the marginalized. He uses the remnant. That's who God uses. So if you feel weak, if you feel marginalized, you're in good company because God can use all of that. Right? The apostle Paul, he felt weak. He asked God even to take away this thorn, this weakness that was plaguing him. And he asked God three times and God said, this is what God told him. And God says, Paul, that in your weakness, my strength is going to be displayed. I think it's like, is it 1 Corinthians 12, 9? Is that, does anybody know? Yeah, it's like one of my life verses, but I keep on forgetting. Is it first or second? But anyway... In, in weakness, God's strength is perfected, right? It's like, in my weakness, I didn't know how I was going to do it. Wow, but God showed up, and this is how I get through. This is what happened. This is our God story. God shows up because it's his story where he's the main character versus our story, right, where we're main character. No, this is Christian. This is God's story, and God is main character, and God shows up in our weakness. It's a process, right? So like I said earlier, right repetition reinforces right reaction. So I'm encouraged that, you know, I mean, I learned how to swim, right? Like I told you back in the day when I was smaller, like motorboat, motorboat, and like, you know, go so slow, motorboat, motorboat, go so fast. And like, I didn't realize that that would set me up to be able to swim in treacherous ocean conditions. I remember a lot of times like when I surf and, um, you know, when I used to go out in, in some large waves with strong current. I remember a couple of times I broke my board, broke my leash, right? Like, and this is one time I was on the North Shore and like I broke my leash. And um, so I had to swim in from way outside and there's rocks on the inside and I was swimming in, I was getting pounded on the head. And I was like, man, I wish, you know, my friend, I don't know where my friend was, but I'm swimming in and this other surfer paddle, he's like, oh, what, your leash didn't broke? And I was like, yeah, I thought he was gonna help, right? He looked at me, oh, too bad, huh? I was like, oh, boy, I can't drown out here. And you're not even going, you know. So he, I was like, wow, oh, this guy make me mad. I was going to swim and get my board, right? But I didn't know where my board was because the current was so nuts. Um, but then there was this other time, I remember, uh, I was paddling out and it was, it was a big day. So I didn't even get out to the lineup, bro. I was borrowing my brother's board. It's like, you know, I'm paddling out and I took a big set on the head and my board broke and my leash broke. So now I got to swim in and this particular place, I'm like, I hate this place. Well, I mean, I like it. It's good, good. But so on the inside, there's this channel and that's where all the sharks live. <laughs> right? So my board is broken. No more my board. My leash broke. So I got to swim into the channel and I got to find the two pieces of my board. So I do that and I cannot leave the board because it's littering, right? So I got to find the other piece and it's farther down. And this other guy, so the story is this. So this other guy, he paddled up to me. He's like, hey, bro, you need help. I was like, yeah, you can take this half of my board in so I can swim in this other half, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So he did that. But the point is this. And I went back out that day. I had another board in my truck because it was a gnarly day. But I went back out and that was like one of the best days that, you know, sorry. Anyway, but 
So that was super memorable. But my point is this. I was glad that other guys probably, maybe when they were younger, took swimming lessons. Motorboat, motorboat goes so slow, right? And that they knew how to swim because you know what? They was out, with, out, out there with me. So in life, I feel like that's the same thing. Just imagine like when we can rejoice in our sufferings, right? Like Paul says, that we can rejoice in our sufferings, that we can endure and that we have character. It's like those guys that they know how to swim well. That's why they're out in the big waves, right? That they can, they can render help or they can render whatever encouragement or whatever. Like just think if you're the only one, but that's not the case because we all are called. We all are called. Everyone has this potential in Christ, right, to be um, battle-tested, to be certified, right? Everybody has this potential. Everybody has this promise. But I want to say that it begins in the shallows. It begins in the four feet. Like, it begins in rejoicing in the struggles when the struggle is not super hard. You know what I mean? We have to develop that. We have to de develop those right practices, those right responses when, it's, when we can. So that when it gets harder, we're in the practice of rejoicing in our sufferings, right? Because we have to start somewhere. Because we do not rise to the occasion. We sink to our training, right? So if we're training ourselves to rejoice, like Paul said, to rejoice in our sufferings, to rejoice in our adversity, then we're going to be ready. Let me read the verse. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Or we can look, you can look to the screen. I think, yep, that's, that's it right there. The product, of, the product of rejoicing in our sufferings. Okay, I want to differentiate, not for, but in our sufferings. The product of that, of rejoicing in our sufferings. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame or disappoint. And it also, if you really look at verse, um, verse 5, it invites the anointing. Man, that's so crucial, you guys. That's so crucial. When we can, in, when we can rejoice, I'd like to call up the worship band. I'm going to bring it to a close. And we're going to have communion as well. But when we can rejoice in our sufferings, not only that it's going to produce endurance and character, we're not only going to be battle-tested, and we're going to be able to be swimming out there in the rough water in this current, this current and big waves and it's, it's like treacherous places of life. We're not only going to be able to do that. We're going to be battle tested to do that. But look what happens. It produces hope. And read verse 5. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So I see that as not only hope, but the anointing is poured out because we're trusting in God. Amen. Now, when we can rejoice in our sufferings, I mean, yeah, sure, we're going we're gonna to bring our requests be made known to God. But in those times, I believe God not only pours his love, but through his Holy Spirit, he pours his anointing, his strength, and strength will rise in our hearts. Amen. Amen. So for Monday... In closing, before I pray. So I was thinking about this. I was like, man, this is, this is good. This is encouraging. But how do we do this? How is it practical? It's tough to do this alone. So for Monday, ask the Lord, you know, if you don't have anybody, if you're, if you're soul journeying alone, have somebody to support or encourage you in these times where you can be real. And, you know, they're not going to judge you. You know, you feel junk or you, whatever. You feel like you lack faith. You feel maybe not even saved. Oh my God, like, where's my faith? That this person, you can tell them that. You know what I'm saying? And they're going like, to speak truth in you. They're going to be out there in the ocean with you when it's hard and when it's turbulent. And they're going to say, yeah, let's pray. I'm going to pray because the love of God needs to soak into our lives at this point. The Holy Spirit needs to come on the scene. His anointing needs to rise. We need to rise in faith. And that person is not going to judge you. He's going to be there or she's going to be there to pray and to lift you up. Amen. So I, I want you to do this. I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, who is this in my life? And if you don't have someone like that, to ask the Lord, Lord, show me, provide someone like this in my life that I can be real. 
because you know what it's tough hey like when you when you're out in big waves and you feel like you could drown like there's no hope that's why they get the guys on the um, the jet skis right in the super big wave because guarantee more guys would be mocking if they never have those guys right ask the lord lord who is in my life that can support or encourage me and the other thing is this flip side of the coin is be somebody ask the lord to help you to be somebody that can encourage or support someone that is going through not not that you can judge oh you know what you should do you should do this this and this not like that kind of support like who wants that support when we're going through tough things but someone that is there that would cry with you or just be with there with you and go through that hard time and that you can just say man i just feel for you and not judge them maybe they did something wrong that incurred this this consequence but you're not there to judge you're just there to support and encourage right because life is tough right and we just need that sometimes we need somebody in our life we need a a Barnabas, someone that is going to encourage us in those tough times. So for Monday, let hope arise. Have someone to support and encourage you and be someone who would also that be somebody that you would you would be an encourager as, as well. Amen. Amen. Father, we come to you this morning and God, we lift up this message to you. And I know for some, we, we, we all going to listen and we're going to take this for um, in a different way. We're going to hear it and we're going to apply it to ourselves. And we're going to think that, oh, I know what you mean, but it's going to mean different for each one of us. So, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would impress on our hearts how we can grab a hold of this truth. Because it is it is an eternal truth. And we can rejoice in our sufferings. Because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope will not disappoint us. And hope invites the anointing. Lord, so may your Holy Spirit just anoint and may he flow through in greater measure right now in each person here within the sound of my voice. Holy Spirit, that you'd begin to minister to each person and that hope would begin to arise to another level. Lord, that you would take hope up to another level in our hearts, in our lives, in our spirit, man, that we would not only be hopeful, but that we could also that it would be effervescent, that it would be an overflow, and there would be a church of overflow, that it would overflow to the people around us. God, we know that you've called us, you called your people to be these people that would be battle-tested, that we would overflow in hope. So that the world would see and they would say, how can you be hopeful? It's because of you, Jesus, that we would be hopeful in you because we have peace with God and we have hope of the coming glory that God has promised, that we are hopeful people, that you deposit hope in our hearts, God. Right now, just receive the Holy Spirit's anointing. More, Lord, that you would pour more. Pour it out, God, in increasing measure. Fill us with your whole Holy Spirit, God, overflowing right now. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.